As, as we start the, the series um, tonight, I think the one thing that we need to acknowledge as we start out is that at one time or another, all of us are difficult people. Amen. Thank you. All of us. Brian is not the only difficult one in the building. Amen. <laughs> All of us at one time or another are difficult people. And the good news is that God loves difficult people. He loves difficult people. And in His Word, He shows us how that we ought to love and care for and minister to difficult people. Alan said already here tonight, that uh, uh, talking about homeless, talking about uh, people that uh, uh, are challenged in, in needs in their life. He said we're to love them as we love ourselves. And I've said this to you many times. The reason so many of us have trouble loving the world is because we're supposed to love them like we love ourselves. And many of us don't love ourselves or know how to love ourselves. And so we can't love other people. And so uh, tonight we're going we're gonna to start off talking. I'm going to use the next four weeks. We're going to talk ne next week. We'll talk about manipulative people. So you want to bring all your manipulators here next week? I mean, invite them all. Get all the manipulators here. The week after that, we're going to talk about hypocritical people. So you'll all want to be here for that. And then the final week, we're going to talk about critical people. So you'll all want to bring your spouses for that. Uh, that final week. But tonight, we're going to talk about needy people. Has anybody ever been told you're needy? Come on, don't lie in here tonight. The Spirit is watching. You ever been told, man, you're just needy. You're just needy. And oftentimes, when you think of somebody who's in need, many of our minds go to the people that Alan was describing to us here tonight. We go to those who have some kind of financial difficulty, some kind of living situation that is not good or not desirable. And, you know, there's, there's some people that are out of work or there's people that have medical situations and they don't have insurance and there's people that bills are mounting up and, and they're struggling to make ends meet and and without doubt when we talk about needy people that's a big part of needy people but but I want to expand it beyond that and I want to talk about tonight also those who are emotionally needy some of you may have someone in your life where everything is drama don't look at your husband or wife right now if you have teenagers you have drama right? Grandkids or, or whatever they are, there's drama. And there's, you know, there, there's people that you know and that I know that they're always the victim. The world is against them. You can have a conversation with them one minute and everything's fine and then you hang up 30 seconds later and, and you, you start getting a text message from them and, and you know, you, you, when you were talking to them, everything was fine and as soon as you hang up, they're starting to send you text messages. Is everything okay? I kind of felt something when we hung up the phone there. Are, are you with me? Anybody have anybody like that? Or, are, you, are you sure everything's okay? Did, are we leaving everything? Do, do you still love me? Or, are we okay? I'm just checking. Just want to know if everything's okay. Or, or then, you know, if it's not that, then they'll call and leave you a 42-minute voice message. <laughs> Woo! They're, they're needy people. I know all your friends. I know, yeah. And, and people that just, people that, that want to consume your time and they want to consume every area of your life. And they're, they're the kind of people that the world is always falling apart and they're always in trouble and they never know what they're going to do and it's always some kind of drama with them. They're needy people. And the truth of the matter is that sometimes when we come across those people who are in need, watch this, if, whether it's financially, whether it's uh, other issues in their life that are affecting the way that they live their life, or whether it's emotional neediness, what, what happens is if, if we come across these people and we don't minister to them in a healthy way, if we don't help them in a right way, then what ends up happening is we can actually end up hurting them more if we're not careful and end up hurting ourselves in the process if we don't know how to treat and how to act and how to minister to people. Now listen to me. There's going to be a lot of things that I say here tonight that I have learned from experience 
And I'm telling you, there are a lot of things that I'm going to talk about here tonight that are even difficult for me to talk about because uh, when, when I, I begin to talk about these things, the person that comes to mind the most is me. So I, don't, I, don't want, I want everybody to draw your feelings in because before I preach this to you, I'm having to preach it or teach it to, to myself. But, but watch this. Here's, here's kind of a, a scenario that happens in my life quite often. Here's, here's what happens to me. Um, somebody has a need. I want to help. So I do something. But whatever I do for that person to them isn't enough or it's not the right thing. So what I end up doing is I try to compensate by doing more. And they come back and they're like, that's still not enough. Now I'm getting uncomfortable, so I start pulling back. That's why I have curtains in my office so nobody can see me there. That way when they walk up and pull on the doors of the church and they're locked, they don't know if I'm here or not. Y'all acting like that's not real. That's a real thing. I am a master hider. Especially when I've tried to help and it hasn't gone well. Come on. Anybody? And so, so I, I'll pull back from that situation and I'll tell myself, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to help them anymore. I'm i got to draw a line. And then when I draw a line, what ends up happening is they start resenting me. Well, why aren't you helping me anymore? And then when they start resenting me and sending me messages, then I start feeling guilty. Whew. And in the end, they're not any better off than they were before, and they might even be worse in worse shape than they were before. And the reason is because even though a lot of times I want to help people, I didn't do it the right way. I didn't do it the right way. Al and I were talking yesterday and we had this conversation. It's like, you know, you have to, you have to kind of start having a discernment when you're, when you're helping people. Because how many of you know that not everybody that comes telling you they need help is on the up and up? And I'm going to get to it here in just a minute, so just hang on. But you, you have to have a little bit of discernment because what ends up happening is you, you can end up hurting them, you end up hurting yourself. And so what I want to talk about for a few minutes tonight is how, how can you and I, because everybody has them, all you are being a little coy here tonight and you're kind of acting a little funny, but the truth is everybody in this room has people around you that you wish We're easier to deal with. Aren't you like the way I put that? You wish they were easier to deal with. And, and you have people in your life that you'd really like to see some good come to and some help come to them. But to do it the right way is the thing that we need to be focused on in a way that's really helpful. So I want to build a couple of definitions with you here tonight. Or I want to build on a couple of definitions. And then we'll... we'll uh, get to the hard stuff. So here's what I want to talk about. And if you're writing things down, here's what you need. Here's the first thing you need to write down. What we need to understand when we begin to try to deal with needy people in our life, we need to understand as believers the difference between relief and restoration. I need to understand the difference between relief and restoration. There are a lot of people in need of relief. What is relief? Well, relief is immediate and temporary assistance. When somebody faces some kind of tragedy, uh, an unexpected loss in their family, somebody dies uh, tragically or they're laid off of a job, uh, something like that, something that happens kind of catastrophically, uh, many of us are really good at providing relief. We're, we're good at offering relief. You know, and I'll give you a perfect example. Last year when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. I stood up in this pulpit and I said, hey, we want to we help today. And on one single Sunday, the people in this church, because you had been seeing what was happening on your televisions and seeing entire cities and areas flooded and people uh, fighting for their lives. This church on a Sunday morning, $4,500 on a Sunday morning, because you know why? They needed to be relief and we're good at providing relief. 
We're good at pro- providing relief. We're, we're short-term stuff we're good at. Think about it. Think about this. Think about the custom that it has. I guess it's an American custom. I don't know where it came. You know, we do some weird stuff in this country. I don't know where this came from. But, I mean, I, I get it. I, I understand. But, but then I don't understand. But this is one of the only places I know where you can lose a close family member and 30 minutes after you put them in the ground, you have a big old party and everybody's eating. That's weird to me. I, I don't know. It's just always been one of those things that makes me scratch my head. But you know why we do that? Because we understand that food's comfort. Right? And, we, and you can have conversation over food. And he, think about this. Think about benevolence that you've been involved in. Somebody in your family maybe has passed away and you've been on the receiving end. Or maybe you've been on the other end and you've been on the giving end. But when somebody dies in your family, one of the first things people want to do is they, they start bringing you food. Why? Because it's a temporary relief, right? you got a lot on your mind. And, and we're good at offering temporary relief. What we're not good at is following up six months later after that person has lost a husband or a child. Right? Y'all still with me? Because that's, it's temporary. And we're, we're good at temporary relief. And, and we, can, we can offer those things without a lot of uh, uh, cramping our style. But the second type of help, we're good at temporary relief. We're good at giving relief. But the second type of help that by nature we're not so good at is uh, restoration. What's restoration? Restoration, get this, restoration is working with somebody to restore them to their God-given potential. It's not doing something for them, it's working with them to help restore them to their God-given potential and purpose. And you know why the reason, anybody want to take a guess at the reason we're not good at restoration? Huh? Huh? Takes the other person to act. Anybody else? Come on, really. Y'all are always talking back to me. Now, now I give you a chance and nobody... They're in a nutshell. You know why we're not good at rest... You know why we're good at relief? Because I can throw money at it and it's over. I can take a dish by and it's done. Restoration takes commitment and time. And we're not good at restoration. And really, when you start thinking about it, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It isn't going to come. You know, it isn't coming and taking a week of vacation. It's just like we, there was a group here that got up and uh, uh, when, when the hurricane came, there were people from all different parts of the world, you know, that took days off to go down there and to try to help clean up. And they'd take a week of vacation, and they did that. But then after a week, they go back, and, and they go back to their lives and doing their thing. And how many of you understand that there are still, I, I don't, this is just what I'm using for example tonight, but here we are months later than that, and there are still cities on the coast like Rockport and places like that that have yet to be restored because it takes more than a week of vacation to bring rest. Restoration. You can bring relief in a week, but you can't bring restoration in a week. Same thing in the spiritual sense. You can, you can get relief. There's a lot of people that use church on Sunday for relief. Ain't nobody talking to me tonight. I need to get my two chairs back out. But a, a lot of people, a lot of people use church for relief. Think about it. Man, they'll come to church on a Sunday. They'll cry. They'll lift their hands. They'll worship with the music that's going on. They'll say amen when the pastor preaches. They'll walk out of here. They'll send me nice notes, tell me it was a great sermon. They'll do all of that because it made them feel better temporarily. But they'll go right back to the way that they were living because relief is easier than restoration. Relief is easier than restoration. And what restoration takes is, sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years. Here's the thing about a lot of the people that we have the opportunity to minister to. Listen, if, if people messing up bother you, this probably is not the place for you. Now that's not a license to... to we're not, we're not saying, hey, we, we believe in the grace of God, just go out and do whatever you want. That's not what we're saying. 
But what we're saying is there are so many people that come to the refuge that have so many life-challenging issues in their life. And what you find out, here, let, let me tell you something. You can work with somebody who is addicted. You can work with them. And, and they can go along and they can, they can do six months. And, and it seems like everything is going just right in their life. They can, you can be meeting with them and everything's going good. They're, they're gaining ground. They're gaining strength. And then in, it seems like overnight, all of a sudden, everything crumbles and falls apart. And they go right back. And see, what you have to understand is, uh, you, in order to restore people, you may have to walk through them with several of those seasons. Come on. You may have to help them pick the pieces of their life up more than one time. But what we don't, see, we don't like it when it gets difficult. Because what we want is for people to get your act together. Now, I'll give you three weeks. I'll meet with you for coffee for three weeks. But after that, i got my life to live. You need to have it together. One of, one of the things, you know, the scripture talks about not comparing ourselves among ourselves. And one of the things that drives me nuts is when, like, one person has had a miraculous deliverance in their life where they, they were addicted to things and God came in and swooped in, took it all away from them. They never had another urge. And somebody else struggles and that person comes in. I don't know what you're doing wrong, but God took it away from me. I never, you just need to trust God more. You're a ding dong. I said that on. Live Facebook. <laughs> because how many of you understand that one person's experience is not necessarily another person's experience? Boy, it would be great if everybody I prayed for never needed me to pray for them again. Can I tell you how much more pleasant my life would be? Y'all don't want to talk to me tonight. If, if everybody could just come in here and one time at the refuge get it and then just come here the rest of the time and support and be everything they're supposed to be, I'd apply for this job. <laughs> but this, this is a messy job. Dealing with people is messy business. Because people don't often get it one time. And, but, but if you stick with people, and if you do the hard work of ministering the right way to difficult people, what you'll find out is sometimes after maybe a long period of time with a lot of ups and a lot of downs and celebrations and tears, finally, by the power of God working through you to minister to somebody else, somebody gets completely healed and clean and restored, and you've helped them back to their God-given potential but you can't get weary in the process because sometimes people are difficult people are needy hello but watch there's a lot of people who want relief but they need redemption there's a lot of people who want relief but they need restoration who are those people well let me give you a couple of scenarios. How about the person that's chronically insecure? Please meet my needs. Please love me. Please value me. Please make me feel special. Anybody know anybody like that? Listen, there are some people, there are some people who I need to be nice listen you don't need to be so needy that every guy or gal that comes along you latch on to like they're the one nobody they ain't nobody talking to me in here So what do I do? Listen, here's what we need. Here's, 
Relationships are hard. They're harder when you do stupid things. They are. They are. Listen. I'm telling you, I'm trying to be delicate tonight. Listen, needy, needy people, people that are insecure, people that are insecure, they'll, they'll sleep with everybody because they believe the lie that I love you. Do you, do you understand? There are people that will tell you anything you want to hear to get from you what they want to get from you. And then when they're finished with you, they'll walk off and never feel another thing for you because they never felt anything for you in the beginning. And the more you allow yourself to be open to that, the deeper hole you dig for yourself, the more insecure you become, the more needy and attached and latched on to people that you become. And what we really need to be doing, listen, because this is where I'm going at this church. I, I've been reading this book called The Trestle and the Vine. It's it just kind of really wrecking my life and working me over. And it, it's The Trestle and the Vine. And the deal is, they, they talk about the church being the trestle and how, you know, everybody know what a trestle is? Y'all know what a trestle is. The, the trestle is the thing that you plant a vine or plant a, put next to a vine and it grows on the trestle, right? And they talk about how in churches we have become so enamored with our trestles, our programs. We've become so, we paint the trestle, we, we, we sand down the trestle, we change the position of the trestle, we get a bigger trestle. And while we're all worried about the trestle, nobody's taking care of the vine. And people, and this was the one that just kind of hit me right between the eyes. They said, as a pastor, the next time somebody say, comes to you and says, can they plug me in somewhere at your church? Instead of thinking about a program, well, I wonder if they'd fit in music. I wonder if they'd fit in children's ministry. I wonder if they'd fit in youth ministry. Instead of thinking about a program which represents the trestle, why don't you think about a couple in your church that you could say, you know what? I'll plug you in. You need to ask that couple right over there to dinner one time a month because they're going through a hard time, and I believe you have something that could help them. You know why? Because when you begin to do that and connect with people, you begin to have influence with people. And when you have influence with people, you can speak things into their life that they need to hear. It's called discipleship. And if I can get you in a place to where you will allow me to disciple you, if you're insecure, then, then I can sit with you, I can pray with you, I can teach you the Word of God, I can show you who you are in Jesus Christ, I can begin to reveal your identity to you through the Word of God, and over time, if you'll listen to what's being said and prayed over you, you'll figure out that security comes from God and not from other people. And when you realize where your security comes from, you'll be restored to your God-given potential. And you won't be seeking relationship after relationship after relationship because relationships bring relief when what you need is restoration. Amen. Yeah. How about, this is something that happens to me quite a bit. That person that never has money. Always hurting. Always broke. What I've learned, here, here's, it's taken me a long time. Listen to me. I'm telling you all, I'm preaching... Because I realize, looking back over my life, it's not been my intention, but I realize I've probably hurt people more than I've helped a lot of people. It's not been my intention. I want to help people. But listen, me throwing $500 at people to solve a problem doesn't solve their problem. It gives them relief. They don't need relief. They need restoration. If I give them, if I give them money, within a few days they're in trouble again. I've gotten to where here at the church, people, and you can ask the people that are around me and work with me and help me do this stuff, but it's gotten to the point here now when people call us for assistance. We help a lot of people here. But when people call us for assistance, first of all, we tell them that honesty, you've got to be honest with us. I think I've probably told you this before. But they'll call and say, can you pay my water bill? It's $93. Well, see, I don't ever give people money like that. I, I, I tell them, I need your account number, and we'll be happy to call the water department, and we'll take care of that for you. So they give me their account number, and I call the water department. And I'm said, I'm, I'm, I need to pay that $93 bill. And the water department says, <laughs> did they tell you there's a 600 in front of that 93 
I just need to know what it's going to take to keep their water on. Like I said, 693. And then you have to call the person back and say, you weren't honest with me. It's hard to help you when you're... And so then I ask, how many months has that gone on? Well, you know, I hadn't paid my water bill in six or eight months. Okay, so if I pay your water bill this month, what's your plan for next month? Because if all I'm doing is giving you relief and you have no plan, what y'all say, call the Methodist church next month? Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly their plan. Exactly. Have y'all been calling me? I, it's you two cats, man. Because people want relief. They do not want restoration many times. Am I making any sense? And what, what's happened is, what we need to start being able to tell people, listen, this is where I'm trying to take us as a church. This is where I'm trying to take us. Because until you get connected to a house, all that's going to happen here for you is relief. If you don't ever sink roots down and get connected to this house, all it will be is relief. There'll never be restoration because you'll never, you'll never consider this the place that you're connected to a community. And do, how, how many of you understand this? That every need you have, God wants to meet through other people. But if you don't ever connect to other people, you're cutting the flow off from what God wants to do. See, what we need to do when people, what, what we need to say to people is, you don't need $500, you need a budget. That's exactly how they sound, Ben, when I tell them that. Exactly. There is pain in that cry, I'm telling you. What you need is more income and less expenses. What people need to understand is, you spent years getting into a financial hole. It might take you a little while to get out. Come on, Israel spent 400 years in slavery and it took them 40 years to get that mentality out of them. You, you have to understand that things don't always happen overnight. But if we're willing to take the time, even with difficult people, you can work with them. You can teach them a new language. I've told you this before, but last year when we did our Dave Ramsey class, I am not making this up. When we got to the night where we cut up credit cards, there was moaning in the house. <laughs> Literal moaning. I saw, I'm not making this up. There were people with tears in their eyes. I'm not making fun of them. There were literally people in the room that, that were honest enough and open enough that night to say, I don't know that I can do this because this is how I live. This is how I live. But if that's the way you live and you never change anything, then nothing will ever change. But if we can begin to work with somebody, even in difficult times, and teach them a new language, so to speak, we can start telling them, hey, don't, you know, here, don't, don't be going in debt to get stuff. If you can't afford it right now, you don't need it right now. Y'all saying, yeah, and y'all up to here in debt. <laughs> but you don't want nobody to know because you need relief, not or restoration, not relief. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on now. Am I doing all right? So it takes time. Restoration takes time. And the problem for us today is whether it's spiritual or physical things, we're offering relief when what we need is restoration. I want to show you something. Acts chapter 3. I'm trying to hurry. Man, time flies when you're having fun. I hope Jamie's not watching, but y'all thought I was long-winded. <laughs> Can't even get no love there. Hallelujah. Watch this. Acts chapter 1. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in a three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man, lame from birth, was being carried. Watch this. This guy, just keep it right there, Ben. This guy was lame. He was born this way. For his whole life, he couldn't walk. He's crippled from birth. He was being carried to, 
Each day they, they carried him and they put him beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so that he could beg from the people going into the temple. Just, just stay there. So he could beg from them. So what do we have here? We have a guy that was in real need, right? Come on, everybody, right? Stay with me. He was in real need. He was crippled. He was lame from birth. And for his whole life, people offered him relief. They carried him. He begged. They gave him money, and every day somebody carried him home. And this guy was smart because if you were to go back and do a little history, you would find out that during that day and in that city, there were three common places to beg. The three most popular places were along the highway where there was a lot of traffic, in front of wealthy people's homes was another place. But the most lucrative place to beg, and not much has changed, was in front of the temple. Because in that day, at that custom, everybody went to the temple. Everybody went to the temple every day. At 3 o'clock they went. So if you were there at 3 o'clock, you got the whole city coming by. Right? And the Pharisees who were self-righteous people, love to give publicly. So these guys were smart. They knew these Pharisees loved to give, so they'd lay out there and beg because they knew one Pharisee would come by and throw a coin in, and the next one wanted to outdo that one, he'd throw two in. Ha, look at me, I'm, look at my almsgiving, look at what I'm spiritual. And so the lame man, the lame man had been trained his whole life that people would meet his needs. Let's go to verse 3. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. What did he ask them for? Money. See, most people think that money is their greatest need. And Peter looked straight at this guy, and John looked straight at him, and he said, they looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them, he gave them his attention. Why? Because he was expecting to receive something from them, because that's the way it worked. He knew he could stay there and beg, and somebody would give him something. His whole life, that people had given him what he wanted. He wanted money, and they had given him money. He wanted relief, and they had given him relief. But Peter changed that. And Peter went on to say in verse number 6, Peter said, silver and gold, or I don't have silver and gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. Amen? Peter said, you want money? I don't have money. But what I do have is what I'll give you. In the name that is above every other name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You're not getting any money, but watch this. I'm telling you to get up and walk. And verse number 7 says, watch this. Watch. See, here's the deal. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. Come on, church. It's not enough to tell somebody, I'm praying for you, and then walk away. Peter and John could have said, we'll be praying for you, man. But they didn't do that. The scripture says, hey, we're going to give you what we have. And they took him by the hand, and they helped him to his feet. They helped him up. Why did they help him up? Because, listen, when you go into the process of helping difficult people, sometimes you have to get your hands dirty and get down to the business of helping them out of the situation that they are in. We need, what do we always say? We want to provide a hand up, not a hand out. Right? But if you're going to provide a hand up, then you've got to be willing to reach your hand down and help somebody up. And they didn't run away when they helped him up. But as they helped him up, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. They stayed with him until he was restored. Mm. Hello? They stayed with him. They worked with him. 
They helped him. Not just relief, but restoration. The problem, not just here at the refuge, but a lot of places. We typically don't like to work with people. Hmm? Watch this. We'll work for somebody, but we won't work with them. And the reason we'll work for them and not with them is because we believe in that frame that we're necessary in order for them to get better. <laughs> and so what we end up doing is we end up placing ourselves into people's lives as a functional savior. We start viewing ourselves as people's salvation and their savior. I'll help them. I have the answers. You need me. I'm the solution. If I don't meet your needs, nobody's going to. And then what happens is, when we realize we're not the Savior, we pull back. I tried, you didn't like it. I pull away, you feel guilty, or I feel guilty. Why? Because I thought I was necessary to make you better. And I was pointing you all the time to me rather than pointing you to Him. And so my help was hurting you and hurting me more than it was helping you and helping me. I don't know if I'm getting across, but I'm trying. So I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm closing, but I want to give you three Man, y'all need to, like, listen faster. <laughs> i got to get these. There, there are three prayers, three prayers of a restore. How many of you want to be restores and not relief-oriented? I want to be restores. So the first prayer, write it down. The first prayer, God, help me give people what they need and not what they want. The lame man said, I want money. Peter said, I'm not giving you money, but I'll give you what I have. Here's, here's the key. People are going to tell you what they think they need. Or they're not going to tell you what they think they need. They're going to tell you what they want. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pray and ask God for wisdom to go beyond what they're saying and beyond what you're feeling and ask God to direct you and discern you or give you discernment to see the real and specific need. Okay, I need to make it clear. David comes to me and says, I, I need money. I need, listen, before you act on anything with anybody, when somebody comes to you for help, the first thing you need to do, you need to hear them, but then you need to tell them, I need to, I need to pray. Because you need to hear the voice of God. And what you need to do, David comes and says, Larry, I need money. I need to be able to say, you know what, David, I hear what you're saying. But I need to get past what you're saying and what I'm feeling. And I need to get down to specifics. So give me, give me a minute. I'm going to pray. Okay, I'm praying. I'm, oh, yeah, thank you, Lord. Ooh, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. So David says, I need money. And I said, David, I heard from the Lord. You don't need money. You need a job. <laughs> and I mean like a real job, like a 40-hour-a-week <laughs> just messing with you. You're, you're just my example, bro. <laughs> Don't get insecure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, you, you don't need... What you need to do is shift your thinking. You, 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 you need the real deal. Because as long as... Just like the lame man, as long as somebody kept giving him what he was asking for, he would have stayed there begging. But when someone came along and said, I don't have and can't give you what you're asking for, but I can give you what I have, it changed his whole life. And if people, if people keep, I'm just using money for the thing, but if people keep asking you for money, but yet they refuse to work, then every time we give them money, we're just giving them no incentive to get up off the couch. Come on. Because we're, we're relieving them, we're not restoring them. And I, and I don't mean to be... I don't mean to be hard tonight. I'm not trying to be hard. But that's good preaching. Come on. Come on, Pastor Larry. Man, I, listen, if you don't give me $500 this week, my car's going to get repossessed. Well, here's an idea. Maybe you don't need a $30,000 car. Maybe you need a $2,500 car. 
Ain't nobody liking me tonight. <laughs> yeah. What we need to learn to say in the process of dealing with difficult people, needy people, is we need to learn to say, you know what? I, got, I have to set boundaries, and I can't meet that particular need. Some people are emotionally needy, you know. Pull on you all the time. I, I'm telling you, this, this, is, this has been a hard, hard lesson over the years for me to learn. Um, I, I know I'm going to make people upset. But when I first started pastoring, if somebody was having ingrown toenail surgery, I'd go and sit at the hospital for six hours while they operated on their toenail. Because I felt like that's what I had to do as a pastor. But what I've learned is the person in surgery doesn't know that I'm there. Y'all not hearing me, but I'm talking. Hallelujah. They don't know that I'm there. So what I do is I go and pray before they go. And then after they're done, a day later when they're awake, I go back. Because I've learned that if I want, listen, if I want to sit through a quadruple bypass, it may make the family feel better about me. But what it does is depletes my ability to do everything else that needs to be done. And that's not being mean. You can love people and have boundaries. Uh, ah. So help me give them what they want or, not, or what they need and not what they want. Number two, help me stay out of the way, God, by not continually rescuing people from their consequences. Man, this is, this is hard for me. If you've got kids, this is hard. It's difficult. I've had to learn this lesson. But I can't... Listen, I love my children. But I can't save them from everything that they get into. Right? And what we need to learn, Galatians 6 and 7, don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. God designed a system that when you sow stupid seeds, you reap a stupid harvest. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. We want to get mad and blame and all that other kind of stuff. Man, mo most of the things that come up in our life are from the seeds that we planted. And then we want people to rescue us from the consequences of the seeds that we planted. And if, if we're constantly rescuing people from the seeds that they planted, they never learn the lessons that is there for them to learn from the decisions that they've made. So when people always come to you wanting you to rescue them from the consequences, no, 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 no. I can't rescue you from every consequence. I have people that write me all the time. They, they get... They get Get arrested, they write me, they want me to bail them out. I can't do that. I don't run a bail bondsman outfit. Because if I bail you out, then I'm going to have to bail him out. Because I know how you are. Well, you did it for him. Hello? There's some things you can't start. There's some things that I can't rescue you from. I'm telling you because I learned the lessons the hard way. Look at, look at wisdom talking to you. Don't do what I've done. Do what I'm telling you not to do. You hear what I'm saying? See, man, it's got to get to the point. I am glad. Man, I am glad. When I, was, when I was 19 years old, I left my mom and dad's house. I left my mom and dad's house when I was 19 to get married. And my dad... Always made us, we, not made us, but we, we worked. Started working when I was 14 years old, mowing lawns for a guy at the church. I went to work for my uncle in the print shop when I was 15 years old, and I've worked my whole life ever since. My mom and dad have always been gracious. 
and loved us. And there's been times that my parents have helped us. But there's never been one time when my parents said, Hey, Larry, you and Roseanne are 35 years old. Y'all can just keep living in our basement. It's getting crazy in here now, ain't it? Hallelujah. If, if we don't... Ever, listen, what you need to do is teach your, teach your 30-year-old how to fold his underwear and send him on down the road. Thank you. Well, if you love me, you would... <gasps> well, we can turn that back around. If you loved me, then you'd do some of the things that we've taught you to do. That thing goes two ways, right? A lot of times, we're hurting more than we're helping. And I'm telling you from lessons that I've had to learn myself. So help me to keep from getting in the way and rescuing from consequences. And finally, number three, God, help me remember. And here's, I'm closing. Help me remember. Let me, let me rehearse them to you. Help me give people what they truly need, what, not what they want. Help me remember to stay out of the way and to stop rescuing people from consequences when they continually make wrong choices and bad decisions. And finally, God, help me remember that I'm in need also. And you are always the answer. And that third one is the key to the whole thing. If you really want to help people who are needy, then you need to recognize that you have needs too. David said in Psalm 70 and verse 5, Yes, I'm poor and I'm needy. I'm in need. Come quickly to me, O God. You're my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. My helper and my savior, come quickly to me. You see, when you realize that you're in need too, then what you do is you remember that you're not the savior, Jesus is. So you take yourself out of the equation as being the Savior. You're not trying to figure it all out anymore. You're, you're trying to point people to Jesus. Because the problem is if you think God needs you to meet everybody else's needs, then your God is too small. If you think God needs you to meet everybody else's needs, then your God is too small. You're not God, but what you are is you're the connector to the source and to the power and to the one who is God. And He can heal. And as long as you think that you're necessary and needed in the equation, you'll overinflate your ego and you'll dilute your ability to connect people to the real power source. So here's what you do. You want to remember that you and I are also in need. I went to Uganda, and when I got to Uganda, I'm going to tell you, when I got there, I felt pretty good about myself. Gavin? I felt pretty good about myself. I got off the plane in a third world country. Felt pretty good because I was bringing things to them. Bringing food and bringing shoes and... Look at us. And I got over there where, where they don't have plumbing in, the, in most of the houses in the area that we were in. And, and people taking baths out in the ditch out in front of their house. And, and, and I'm feeling pretty good about what I'm doing. And, and then on the day that we were giving food away, all those people in those ditches showed up at church. And when they showed up at church, they had bigger smiles than I had ever seen. And it wasn't because of what we were giving them. They were just happy to be able to come in and to worship the Lord. And I began to be smitten in my spirit. And I began to understand that, yes, I'm bringing some good here. And I'm helping them in some needs but they're also giving me something that I can take back with me because I realize that no matter where you are everybody's in need and I'm in need and they're in need but when we came together I gave them something but they gave me something back because God is the source of all of our needs <sighs> stand with me I'm in need as much as anybody I know. You know what? What are you in need of, Larry? Well, I'm in need of prayer. I need encouragement. I need forgiveness. I need support. I need some friendship. I don't have all the answers. I'm in need. 
And when you and I can agree that everybody in this building is in need, then suddenly we realize that I can help connect somebody else to God in a way that they need. And then if you see me in need, you can connect me to God in a way that I need. And suddenly I'm not just offering temporary relief to people, but I'm offering restoration. Because when you get connected to a body and when you sink a roots down into a church that loves one another and loves people, you begin to view people as not just the person that sits down the row from you, but I can invest in these people's lives. That's what we've got to do in 2018 refuge we've got to get involved in the lives of the people that are in here because i know some of you think you're pretty good the truth is you're broken just like everybody else hello and when we get to the place where we can see that we all have needs it's easier to deal with difficult people needy people Because then, if I understand that I have needs and you have needs, then I need to be restored as much as you need to be restored. And I want to be restored because I want to reach my God-given potential. And if I reach my potential, I can help you reach your potential. And if we all reach our potential, we can change our city. Amen? Stop viewing people as just the difficult, needy people. Start realizing that for somebody, you're difficult too. Hello? For somebody, you're difficult too. I know you think you're roses. But sometimes you're thorns. Hello? And if I can see my neediness, God can help me. Amen? Father, I thank you in this place tonight. I thank you for great grace. I thank you for abundant life. And I thank you for the promise of restoration. Father, I pray over this group of people for 2018 that we would stop living disjointed and disconnected from one another. That we would not just be trying to find a place in the church for some program that we fit into. but That we would begin, we would begin to identify people in this house that we can be connected to. And through connection, bring strength and bring restoration and bring hope. Father, I just pray that this would be a year of great awakening for this house. That we would discontinue the practice of sitting back and waiting for some program or some thing to come along that will motivate us. and That we will become motivated by the people that stand around us. Lord, I pray that this would be the year that we don't run from difficult people, but we embrace them and walk with them through the tough seasons of their life so that we can see the miracle of restoration. And then the words will come true that Paul said that we can turn around and comfort others with what we have been comforted with. So I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for abundant grace and life that is on this body. We give you praise and thanks, and everybody said in Jesus' name.